Good morning, everyone. My name is Laurent Lambert. I'm delighted to welcome you today for this lecture. The situation in the Gaza Strip, as we all know, has been getting worse and worse week after week, month after month, for now nearly half a year. The situation has known a very high intensity conflict. And despite a short period of time during which the um, conflict stopped, the humanitarian situation now is catastrophic all across the Gaza Strip. All life supporting infrastructure has been destroyed in several areas and starvation is getting worse, particularly in North Gaza, where 31% of children under the age of two are suffering from acute malnutrition, according to UNICEF. Paradoxically, some would say, the main organization providing life-saving services in the north of Gaza, the UNRWA, has been recently prevented by the Israeli government to operate there. The UNRWA has also been under a very great number of attacks, be they violent attacks or also media attacks from different groups of pressure. So why is there so much interest and in violence towards, be it physical or symbolic violence towards the UNRWA? Why is the UNRWA so important? Why are some countries so strongly supporting it? Why can not UNRWA be replaced by some other organizations? To be able to understand all what is going on behind these politics of the access to the north of Gaza, for instance, for the UNRWA, we need to probably speak a bit more about what is the UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Work Agency, which has been operating for seven decades with Palestinians and especially refugees all across the territories of Palestine and beyond. To speak about this today with me, there is the uh, world-renowned professor Ricardo Bocco, who is an emeritus professor of political sociology at the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at the Geneva Graduate Institute. His fieldwork experience spans over three and a half decades in the Middle East, particularly Jordan, Lebanon, and Palestine, as well as Israel. He has significantly worked on issues of development policies and state building, on humanitarian aid and refugees, and on the monitoring the impact of international aid on civilian populations. Dr. Bocco earned his PhD from Sciences Po Paris and holds degrees in development studies, cultural anthropology, and Arabic language. During the 2000s, he led large-scale research projects on international aid in the Near East for various United Nations agencies. He was a direct research director and professor at the former Graduate Institute of Development Studies and the Geneva Graduate Institute, where he taught political sociology in the anthropology and sociology departments. Welcome, Professor Boko. Ricardo, mm -hmm. we're delighted to have you today. Um, you will have the floor for as long as you want, probably 25, 30 minutes, or even more if you wish. And then we will have, uh, hopefully, the pleasure to have a question and answer time with you. So on this, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation. The floor is yours, Ricardo. Thank you, Laurent, for this introduction. And thank you for having me today. As you said, uh, UNRWA uh, has not been uh, so popular as it has been over the past uh, six months or so. And this uh, not because uh, she was exactly seeking for the uh, popularity that has been bestowed about uh, the agency by the Israeli propaganda, who has been accusing UNRWA uh, for complicity with Hamas and asking for the uh, dismantlement of uh, uh, the agency. Um, I think it is important to begin with 
to put into perspective uh, what is UNRWA, it, its uh, juridical status, um, and then uh, uh, move forward toward more uh, uh, concrete issues uh, that the agency and its uh, civil servants are uh, faced uh, today. UNRWA was created uh, in uh, December 1949 and became operational in uh, May 1950. It was created uh, um, as a response to the uh, 1948 war, uh, where uh, more than 750,000 uh, Palestinians became refugees in uh, the West Bank, in uh, Gaza, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. Of course, the refugees went also to other regions, but the bulk of the refugees was concentrated in these five areas, which became the so-called five fields of intervention of UNRWA. When UNRWA was created, um, she had the mandate uh, for delivering uh, um, humanitarian aid to the Palestinian refugees, uh, but was not tasked uh, for finding a political solution to the conflict. For that, the United Nations Compensation Commission for Palestine uh, was created. The agency still uh, exists. Uh, he has an office in New York and one in Vienna, uh, but uh, she was, uh, for several reasons, prevented from uh, doing its own job. So uh, UNRWA was also created in a specific uh, geopolitical context, which was the beginning of the Cold War. And in that period, in that context, uh, um, the uh, United States and the European states uh, thought important not to some way deliver the Palestinian refugees uh, to the communist propaganda. And therefore, the creation of an agency for them was uh, some way a, um, uh, say, a, a mean to uh, prevent uh, among the refugees uh, ideological uh, drift towards uh, the communist enemy. Now, behind uh, the idea of uh, UNRWA, as uh, Dr. Laurent uh, remember, is the United Nations Relief and Work Agency for Palestine refugees in the Near East. The, the word work in the acronym of UNRWA um, would be better translated as development. At the beginning, uh, the idea was that uh, through a number of uh, development programs, mainly agricultural programs, uh, one of the indirect aim of UNRWA was to resettle the Palestinian refugees where they were. But this um, found that the opposition uh, both of the uh, League of the Arab States and uh, by refugee committees, who basically were asking for the implementation of Resolution 194 of December 1948, which was guaranteeing uh, to uh, the refugees the right of return and or compensation. The resolution 194 has not yet been implemented so far. Now, uh, from its very beginning, the existence of UNRWA uh, was a real problem for Israel. Why? First of all, because it recognized the existence of refugees, of people that were victims of forced displacement during the 1948 war. And this was uh, contradicting uh, one of the founding myths of Israel, meaning that the Jews were a people without land for a land without people. 
and the land was not without people because more than 750,000 Palestinians were expelled. The second point is that over time, uh, UNRWA became uh, the symbol of the Palestinian tragedy and injustice. And uh, UNRWA uh, and the refugees, I would say the refugees, first of all, who became uh, a very important uh, uh, tool uh, in uh, the creation of the Palestinian national movement, uh, UNRWA was delivering assistance to them was basically um, uh, ensuring uh, not only that uh, the refugees, the well-being of the refugees, but also symbolically re representing their rights, which is uh, the other item that uh, Israel uh, wouldn't like to live with. Um, finally, an important point also uh, to stress is that uh, since the beginning, uh, the well, the Palestinian refugees were defined administratively as uh, those Palestinians that had been living in uh, Palestine, the, the Palestine of the British Mandate period, at least two years before the 15th of May 1948, meaning that uh, the uh, the Palestinians who were uh, fulfilling that uh, uh, characteristic could be enrolled uh, in the UNRWA registers uh, for having right to uh, food, shelter, I mean, the, the basic uh, humanitarian uh, needs to be covered uh, for people that uh, uh, are refugees. And uh, uh, the other important point uh, to stress that is contested by the Israeli propaganda is that uh, uh, UNRWA, according to international law, has been assisting not only the direct victims of the 1948 conflict, but also their descendants. And this is a rule that applies worldwide, not only to UNRWA, but uh, to uh, all the refugees that are assisted, for example, by the UNHCR. Uh, the UNHCR delivers aid and protection to uh, Somali refugees, Afghan refugees, and others. I mean, refugees uh, whose fate, or, or at least uh, victims of a conflict that has not yet found a political solution. And therefore, since there is no political solution so far to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, uh, the uh, original refugees and their descendants are entitled to uh, humanitarian aid. At the origin, uh, UNRWA didn't have a protection mandate like uh, the UNHCR has had uh, over uh, the refugees that they were assisting. Um, the lack of uh, a protection mandate, uh, which is all a story in itself, because, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, I mean, to make a long story short, in the um, story, in the life of the agency, the question of the protection, uh, though not included in the mandate, was developed starting uh, from the late 70s, early 80s. It was at the time of uh, Giorgio Giacomelli, uh, the Commissioner General uh, of UNRWA, that had the, in the early 80s set up uh, a refugee protection unit meant to monitor uh, basically, the human rights situation uh, of the Palestinians in the fields where the agency was operating. Um, so, this is, uh, let's say, a wide uh, picture, uh, historical picture of, 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 of the UNRWA. 
Um, and therefore, uh, the first point when uh, Israel is asking for the dismantlement of UNRWA is, uh, doesn't make sense because uh, you cannot uh, delete UNRWA uh, as you wish. <laughs> Since uh, UNRWA was established by the General Assembly of the United Nations, it is only the General Assembly of the United Nations that could decide about ending its mandate. And by the way, the mandate of UNRWA uh, explicitly uh, specifies that uh, uh, the uh, agency will be dismantled only when the conflict will be solved and therefore the necessity of uh, the um, existence of the agency will diminish. But uh, uh, if you see it uh, uh, in the long durée in the past 70, 75 years, because this year, by the way, is the 75th anniversary of the creation of the agency, um, UNRWA has become uh, instrumental not only for the refugees, but also for the host countries. Meaning uh, that uh, today UNRWA assists uh, almost 6 million refugees registered with the agency in uh, five fields. Meaning uh, that uh, UNRWA provides three main services, education, health, and uh, uh, social welfare. Um, which, by the way, are three um, services typical of, of a state. And that's why UNRWA in the past uh, was uh, labeled as the blue state, blue because of the flag of the United Nations. And uh, in, the, uh, in their services today, UNRWA employs uh, some 30,000 uh, civil servants. 1% of them are expatriates, uh, meaning non-Arab and non-Palestinians, and 99% uh, are mainly Palestinian refugees themselves and some Arab employees, mainly from the host countries uh, where UNRWA operates. And uh, the budget of the agency, uh, which uh, in the latest years has been uh, uh, oscillating between one billion and one point five billion dollars, uh, is uh, allocated for uh, two thirds for education, meaning uh, schools, and uh, of course uh, teachers, professors, etc. 25% on health, the clinics, the doctors, um, and uh, the rest uh, for um, social services. Of course, there are also other minor um, um, expenses. Um, but basically, UNRWA doesn't have a fixed budget. Uh, it is according to the wish and the will of international donor that UNRWA is funded. And uh, is funded, uh, uh, its mandate is officially renewed every two years. And, there, and therefore you have a sort of a constant fundraising uh, situation that the agency is faced with. And this uh, becomes even more important uh, according to the context where the agency operates. Because uh, if it is true that uh, uh, the priority of the agency is to assist the Palestinian refugees officially registered with the agency, when uh, the agency has found itself in the past uh, in a wider conflict in, in the host country, UNRWA has been assisting not only the Palestinian refugees, but also the local population. Uh, and this has been done through humanitarian aid provided by 
uh, donor countries according to the needs of a conflictual context. So uh, UNRWA is well known in the region for the services it has provided uh, the Palestinian refugees and the general population. And as I was saying before, uh, is uh, the fact that uh, uh, for the host countries, because of the services of UNRWA, uh, they have, uh, let's take the example of Jordan, where is, which is the country, the host country, um, that uh, has the highest percentage or the highest number of uh, Palestinian refugees assisted by UNRWA. They are 2.4 million. Um, this means that uh, the UNRWA schools or the UNRWA clinics play a key role in the country because if UNRWA was not there, the expenses for all of that would be fall on the Jordanian government. And therefore, the money that is indirectly received by the host countries through UNRWA for assisting part of the resident population, be they nationals or not, in the case of Jordan, most Palestinian refugees are also Jordanian citizens, not all, but many of them, most of them. Uh, so the, the, the very existence of UNRWA and its services are part and parcel of the political economy of the country, of the host country. By the way, uh, after uh, the signing of the Oslo Accords, one of the first things with the creation of the Palestinian National Authority uh, was uh, the fact that uh, Arafat uh, asked immediately UNRWA not to cease its uh, activities until a final uh, status peace settlement was going to be found. So um, now if I go back to one of the items uh, raised by Dr. Laurent on the present situation in Gaza, uh, where uh, many donors have been buying into the Israeli propaganda. I mean, so far there are two commissions that are working, uh, two inquiry commissions that are working to um, understand what has been happening with the uh, 12 employees originally that uh, were supposed to be part uh, of the Gaza attack in Israel by Hamas. Uh, both commission, one from the OIOS, which is the internal UN commission, and the other one led by the former <coughs> uh, French uh, foreign minister and three Scandinavian Institute, uh, we don't have yet the results of these inquiries. <coughs> but based on the accusations of uh, the Israeli authorities that uh, were formulated, by the way, the day after the verdict of the International Court of Justice, meaning uh, the ICG gave its verdict on the question of genocide in Gaza on the 26th of January and on the 27th, the question of UNRWA came up, just by chance, of course. Huh? Uh, so what happens is that uh, beside uh, the wish and will of uh, Israel to dismantle UNRWA, but as I try to explain, it cannot be uh, done uh, so quickly, uh, beside the juridical uh, issue, there is a very practical situation because uh, if you wish to replace UNRWA with other agencies, which agencies, first of all? Uh, but in any case, in Gaza, if you want to replace the 13,000 civil servants of UNRWA, with whom you will replace them? I mean, this means that if you want to have uh, the ICRC, WHO, UNICEF, whatever, that increase their role, well, who should they employ? Should they bring in employees from elsewhere? 
<laughs> no, <laughs> the, 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 the same people working for UNRWA who know very well their field and the needs of the population have to be employed. So uh, is, is, is rather an ideological political debate, the one of uh, dismantling UNRWA or replacing it with other agencies, etc., etc. And uh, this can be understood only on the one side, reminding what UNRWA means for Israel on the one side, but also on the uh, ambiguity of uh, European and uh, North American countries uh, in relation to Israel, meaning that uh, the, the <laughs> uh, Europe and, and uh, the US are still in the thinking that uh, they are guilty because of the Shoah, of the Holocaust. They've been ready to close their eyes and to barter, uh, let's say, their closing of the eyes with their guiltiness for the show. They're still stuck in that. Germany is the classical and the greatest example. Uh, I'm following what is going on in Europe uh, in the debates uh, related not only to the funding of UNRWA, but on the press freedom, uh, freedom of debate in universities, etc., etc., and uh, the ways that a number of governments uh, are uh, repressing uh, the freedom of speech is uh, appalling, is appalling. Uh, also because uh, many of uh, uh, these European states have been uh, voting in their own parliament uh, uh, the adoption of the International Holocaust Remembrance Association, the IHRA, which basically equates a critique to the state of Israel as an anti-Semite position, uh, which is a complete nonsense. I don't know. I am uh, <laughs> Swiss and Italian. So if I criticize, it's not because I criticize the policy of <laughs> the <laughs> Italian government that they become an anti an anti Italian <laughs> nonsense and uh, the the uh, usual uh, targeting of the Israeli government towards Israeli Jews or Jews worldwide who criticize Israel is to label them as uh, self hating Jews. So we are really in, in a false debate because uh, this doesn't have anything to do with being anti-Semitic if you criticize the policy um, of, the, of the government and especially of the Israeli government today, what they are doing in Gaza. Sorry, I've been going a little bit aside. <laughs> the main no, it's... it's uh... <laughs> Absolutely, uh, very important to 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 put the context also of, of these yes. ongoing developments in Europe, um, which I think are very important because at the same time that now it has been um, more and more criticized by the populations of Europe, um, this initial support of some few key European countries at the very beginning, of course, Germany, France and the UK, has played a great role in probably this feeling by the Netanyahu regime of feeling it could target who, whatever, including the INRWA, which is the backbone of the humanitarian assistance system in, in Gaza and beyond. So thank you very much for, for highlighting this. Um, but Just one last point uh, please, um, concerning the funding of UNRWA and uh, not the total absence, but the was I absence of the Arab states in funding UNRWA, uh, even though uh, recently Saudi Arabia has allotted $40 million to um, UNRWA. Uh, the point uh, uh, goes back once again uh, to 1948-1949, uh, uh, 1949, meaning that uh, uh, when UNRWA was created, the position of the League of the Arab States was quite clear. Basically, they said, uh, you, the Europeans, 
have created the problem and you pay for it. I'm sorry for putting it uh, very bluntly, but this was uh, the crux of the issue. Right? Uh, and this has is, is, is kept being the case. Now, we have seen uh, uh, Qatar, we have seen Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, that have been uh, proactive, uh, not much in funding UNRWA per se, mm -hmm. but often in uh, uh, intervening, for example, in Gaza, with the construction of hospitals, therefore helping uh, uh, the local population and refugees, because uh, in Gaza, uh, more than 75% uh, of the residing population are registered with UNRWA. So uh, by building hospitals or uh, promoting development projects in the Gaza Strip, um, a number of Gulf countries have contributed to the welfare of the population. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Ricardo, if you want now, we can shift to a phase of question and answers with the public. And I'm sure people will have questions because, again, this matter of UNRWA now is so topical because of recent developments mm -hmm. that I'm sure a lot of persons have questions. So I remind everyone that you can ask questions uh, via Zoom. There is the question and answer device. <coughs> which would be easier than raising hands. And I will start myself with probably the first question. Um, Ricardo, you've been very clear that we can't replace the UNRWA. At least we can't dismantle it. That's what you've mentioned. You've explained why it had, you know, its mandate coming from um, the General Assembly. Um, and so the General Assembly would be needed to uh, dismantle it. And in its mandate, it has to operate up until we have a solution and there is no need for it. But many people still argue, I don't agree, but I just want you to be able to answer this, that it can be replaced by the UNHCR. And I've, I've, you've been clear that it cannot, but many people keep on making this argument. So if you want to answer it once and for all, that would be, <laughs> that would be very appreciated. Well, uh, if uh, the UNHCR replaces UNRWA, Israel uh, will be uh, less than happy. <laughs> because this means that uh, uh, all the number of uh, Palestinians who became refugees, but uh, were not living after 48 in the five fields of UNRWA, for example, Palestinian refugees uh, that uh, went to live in Iraq, uh, that went to live uh, in the Gulf, uh, in Egypt, could finally ask the HCR to get uh, to be recognized as refugees and get protection. This mm. means that the number of Palestinian refugees would increase at least by 1.5 million, which is the estimates around the Palestinian refugees' descendants today not registered with uh, UNRWA. So will be more than 7.5 million refugees, which, by the way, uh, is a big chunk of the Palestinian population worldwide that is mm -hmm. estimated to 12.5 million. So basically, 65% uh, of the Palestinian refugees worldwide are refugees. So uh, having a UNHCR replacing uh, uh, UNRWA doesn't solve, uh, I mean, would be an interesting point for uh, for uh, the Palestinian refugees to be recognized, um, but wouldn't uh, solve the problem. I mean, the problem of uh, uh, <laughs> ensuring that uh, 
UNHCR employees uh, in a situation like that one in Gaza uh, would not be, uh, if not complicit, sympathizer of Hamas or of whatever. I mean, you can be a sympathizer or member of the Fatah or the other Palestinian faction. Uh, you are, it's not for that that you are a terrorist or considered as such by the Israeli authorities or a number of the European and North American states. Yeah. Another question uh, that I have here is, could the UNRWA survive the lack of funding from the US government? Because for one year, they've just announced, for the context, for everyone, they've announced that for one year, they would not finance the UNRWA. So could the UNRWA survive this, especially if it were to be repeated? Well, uh, so far, well, actually, Tuesday, um, Philippe Lazzarini, the Commissioner General, was in Geneva. And he declared uh, publicly that uh, with the present situation, UNRWA uh, can function until the end of May. After that, they have to stop their operation. This now, May? Wow. This, yes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, so this means uh, that the problem is not only Gaza. The problem will be the region. The problem will be uh, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, the West Bank, and Gaza. So who has the interest to uh, break this system? I mean, uh, UNRWA has been subjected to many critiques, but one uh, has made the, the unanimity for the funding of the agency, which is that UNRWA, historically speaking, has brought stability to the region. Because what is at stake is uh, 6 million people and uh, <laughs> the economy of a number of host countries. So what do we do? Right. So in May, that's a, a very big concern. I had not this figure. Thank you very much for highlighting this. Yeah, right. and that is, yes. And that leads to other questions with regards to the diplomatic impact of the U.S. going away from UNRWA. First, does the U.S. lose any say in the activities of the UNRWA? Does that play any role? This is one aspect which is asked about. Another aspect is, does the lack of U.S. funding will mean a greater role for countries such as China or Russia or other countries? Do you expect them to play a greater role? Have they done this in the past? Um, <clears throat> concerning the possible uh, uh, positioning of new funders, I doubt that Russia will bring money to uh, China, possibly. Um, but, uh, I mean, China in this moment is playing uh, uh, on several chessboards. And uh, by uh, criticizing uh, uh, openly the Israeli policies in the war uh, is actually uh, working uh, on the, a new coalition with the BRICS uh, and with the what we call usually the global south, right? who has been uh, more and more supporting, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, the Palestinian cause. Uh, but uh, the it's not the first time that uh, UNRWA has been confronted uh, to a funding crisis. There was already during the Trump presidency a sudden cut of all the funding. And this was uh, replaced with, uh, by other donors. So we may imagine that uh, uh, other donors will uh, supplant 
uh, the possible lack of funding by the US, who, by the way, declared that uh, they will not fund UNRWA until 2025. I mean, we have to see how the situation will develop. But um, what uh, is at stake uh, behind the UNRWA, behind the war in gas, is the moral collapse of the West. Meaning uh, that uh, we have been living so far in a world that uh, after 1948, with the chart of the human rights, the same year of the Nakba, uh, the international order has been structured around the vision of international law. Now, international law has not always been applied as it should have been. I mean, uh, just a thing to the Americans in Vietnam, uh, in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan. So how many crimes of war, crimes against humanity have been com committed? But the Palestinian question, is more than ever uh, a symbolic question of the non-application of international law, of the what in French we call the, the policy of de poids de mesure, not applying uh, the same rules to everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, the West in general uh, is not yet um, gone over the phase of decolonizing its own mind. The West, uh, even though uh, the story of decolonization began after the Second World War, in this lapse of time, uh, Europe has not yet uh, uh, dealt with its own colonial past. And it let's survive in the 20 first century, a settler colonial state, which is mm -hmm. it, in the post-colonial, so-called post-colonial world. So this is an issue that uh, European governments and the United States do not seem uh, to look at. They are still uh, in their uh, thinking of being uh, of managing the world. And in this framework, when I say that there is not only a moral collapse, but uh, a real challenge to the uh, world order, is that uh, if tomorrow China decides to get into Taiwan, what can be said to them? Sorry, you can't because this is against international law. The Chinese will laugh. The Russians are, are already laughing at uh, North America and Europe when they tell them that they uh, are committing war crimes uh, in Ukraine. I mean, with all my due respect, uh, but uh, they don't care. Like Israel doesn't care. So <clears throat> in this, uh, uh, this is why I'm saying that uh, Gaza what is happening in Gaza goes well beyond uh, the specificity of uh, the local context. Very much so. Um, I have two um, people who intervened and um, I will try to read from their intervention. So I have a common question from Ali Zartari. Your views on weakening UNRWA to the extent it cannot meet its mandate, so he would like to obtain your views, on the weakening of the UNRWA to the extent it cannot meet its mandate in full, giving rise to others, maybe other UN programs to step in. So could they uh, intervene? For instance, the UNDP or other programs could compensate partly or fully. And in addition, um, to this comment, there is, don't you see a contradiction between the role of the senior humanitarian and reconstruction coordinator and UNRWA's historic role in Palestine? Um, concerning the first question, 
is not much UNDP, but rather OCHA, uh, the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, mm -hmm. um, that uh, could step in. But uh, as uh, the, the acronym of this agency says, they are coordinating. Uh, UNDP um, always plays uh, in the countries where they are present a role of uh, coordinator of different UN agencies and not only in humanitarian affairs. Uh, but no, uh, I mean, I come back to the same point. Uh, if uh, UNDP steps in, so what they do? Which employees uh, they would employ? Yes. What kind of, uh, should they uh, adopt uh, another policy than that of UNRWA? How, I mean, also in Gaza, UNDP is present, of course. They take care of a number of development projects. But when you look at uh, the structure of the services offered by uh, UNRWA, if you take, for example, the big bulk of their activities, which are education. So UNICEF is not uh, in a position to supplant UNRWA. I mean, supplanting uh, uh, the educational services by UNRWA via UNICEF would take a long, long time and stays. Well, how do you and where do you recruit the teachers? Then in the present context, the first uh, big issue is infrastructure. Most of schools have been destroyed. All the universities have been destroyed. So uh, I don't see the point of supplanting UNRWA for the sake of what? Because the Americans and the Israelis uh, uh, want uh, this agency to be dismantled? No, it's crazy. Uh, sorry, um, there was also another question uh, which I did not answer, maybe. So do you see a contradiction <clears throat> between the role of the senior humanitarian and reconstruction coordinator and UNRWA's historic role in Palestine? No, they are, uh, <clears throat> um, there are, they are complementary, but uh, not the same because uh, uh, UNRWA is not uh, a, a reconstruction agency. Uh, if uh, we think to the day after the war in Gaza, the reconstruction uh, would be a, a huge enterprise. And probably uh, there could be a specific office for that. Uh, UNRWA can be part of, but it's not uh, its mandate. So the reconstruction per se would be another task. And the huge task. Indeed, indeed. I have a question from Ines uh, Shuaibi. In the absence of a political so solution for the Palestinian refugees registered at UNRWA and their status as stateless, and which UNRWA was established for uh, this sake, how can Israel propose to dismantle UNRWA in the lack of finding a solution for stateless refugees? especially in Gaza and Lebanon, etc. So how does Israel manage to articulate it so that it can be taken? Because it has been taken seriously, at least by member of Congress in the US. So how, how does it articulate it? Well, uh, they basically, the Israeli authorities are basically saying that uh, UNRWA in Gaza, and they focus on Gaza because they cannot say the same in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, uh, even uh, in uh, the West Bank. They are basically saying that uh, the UNRWA in Gaza has been complicit with Hamas. Mm. Right. So either they, they take the examples of the tunnels in Gaza, the tunnel that was under yeah. the headquarters of, of uh, UNRWA in Gaza, or the role of the employees. Yes. So this is how they uh, they present uh, the issue. Huh? So so, uh, but this is this is the political narrative. But what I was asking, by the way, which has been largely debunked by Western intelligence agencies, so in Canada and in Australia, um, France, and so on, um, intelligence agencies have put forward that there is no hard evidence at all in 
what um, the Israeli government has provided them. So, but I think the question was more about what do they propose in terms of what are their solution? What are they saying sh as what should replace the UNRWA? Well, uh, as far as I know, for example, uh, there has been a few weeks ago um, in Geneva, the uh, UN Watch, which is a, a typical uh, Israeli watchdog, uh, and has been convening uh, a conference, which was attended by very few people, by the way, concerning the dismantlement of UNRWA. And uh, basically, they are open uh, to many possibilities, but basically, they would like to cancel the status of the Palestinian refugees. Hmm. This is what Israel has been aiming for decades. Now, Palestinians are not all stateless. There are a number of Palestinians, uh, those named in Jordan, who most of them have a Jordanian citizenship. Many of them as well in the West Bank. Um, some uh, in Gaza. But now, the point uh, is that, and, and in Syria, uh, the Palestinian refugees uh, had a special status as residents with a specific laissez-passer uh, and uh, uh, economic integration in the Syrian labor market. Probably the worst situation is that in Lebanon, for the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, who Today, they amount to some 300,000. Um, I mean, in terms of real residents, even if UNRWA is a higher, fi higher figure for, uh, for them. Uh, but but um, no, the, the, for Israel, the point is uh, let's do away with the refugees. And actually, they have been accusing the West of uh, entertaining uh, the refugee problem. If you take the latest book of uh, Mrs. Uh, Einat Wilf, who is uh, a, a, an Israeli Jewish Labour Party uh, activist and former uh, Knesset member, she wrote a book uh, where basically she argues that the Palestinian refugee problem is because of the Western powers' uh, will to um, fund uh, UNRWA and therefore to prolong the agony of the Palestinian refugees. So she is basically turning the victims of the 48 war and their descendants from victims into perpetrators in some way. I mean, uh, it is their fault if they are refugees today because or because the PLO has maintained their, um, their status. I mean, it's not that uh, people have been maintaining the status. The, po the point uh, is very simple. The 194 resolution has never been implemented and not even a plan for compensating the refugees, which would mean to recognize the refugees mm -hmm. in their status as victims. This is something any Israeli government so far uh, has never been uh, uh, accepting the question of the victimhood uh, of the refugees because Israel would be directly responsible for the fate of the refugees. I don't know if I'm answering to, to the question. To a large extent, yes. Uh, I have the two probably final questions. One is, as Israel declared UNRWA non grata organization in the north, at least, of Gaza, do you have concerns about the future of the, org of the organization and its staff, maybe not anymore its facilities because they have been largely destroyed, but about the organization and its staff in Gaza, do you think 
it it will be made impossible for them to operate. Mm. That's the first question. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and my yes. Yeah. I begin with this please um, let's say first of all over the past uh, few weeks um, Israel has been um, cutting the residence permits of uh, international staff UN and others in Gaza but also in the West Bank now in the north of Gaza the situation is quite peculiar how the humanitarian aid works today in Gaza. Basically, most uh, food or uh, humanitarian aid at large comes from Egypt. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, the uh, what is uh, thrown uh, on Gaza by air uh, or by sea. But most of the uh, humanitarian aid since uh, October 7, as well as before, but particularly from October 7, is uh, coming from Egypt and is uh, brought by lorry. Lorries go to Rafa. From Rafa, they are dispatched to Karem Shalom or another place for inspection by the Israeli security. Once uh, the security clears the lorries, uh, their um, staff is put on the other side of the border on Palestinian and UN trucks. And there are basically two systems working in parallel. In the north of Gaza, since you were asking for that, the UN is not anymore present with their own trucks. There are five private companies, Palestinian private companies, that act there. And what they do, basically, they transport humanitarian aid. Um, a big chunk of it is sold to the local merchants, uh, who then uh, sell uh, the humanitarian aid. And they employ uh, a private security staff, Palestinian, for securing uh, the distribution of this aid in the northern Gaza Strip. Now, you can imagine that uh, from, let's say, Arish or Cairo, the cost, uh, let's say, of, of um, uh, one pound of, uh, uh, let's say, bread, not bread. Uh, wheat. Wheat. Uh, will increase after uh, each step. Yes. Uh, it will more than double. Sometimes it reaches five times the original price. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of people who are making profit out of the situation. Certainly the Egyptians uh, who control part of the traffic and then a number of uh, Palestinians who are not necessarily Hamas affiliated. And in the north of Gaza, one of the policy that uh, the Israeli army is trying to do is to, um, let's say, <clears throat> develop uh, a system of aid distribution with this private um, Palestinian company against Hamas. Mm -hmm. Not anymore controlling the northern Gaza Strip. So there is all a uh, all an architecture of uh, how humanitarian aid uh, is provided, delivered, uh, and uh, what kind of business is done about it on the shoulder, of course, of the Palestinian population who is starving. So, yeah. The final question, Ricardo. Netanyahu is apparently more isolated than ever, more criticized than ever in Israel too, not just on the international scene. He may survive it or he may not. Do you think that if Netanyahu and his extreme right coalition were to fall, would that make a big difference for the UNRWA? 
Mm. I don't have the crystal ball. <laughs> wise, wise answer, Ricardo. <laughs> Unluckily. <laughs> no, uh, first of all, uh, will uh, Netanyahu fall? <laughs> this is the big uh, question because uh, yes. he's a very shrewd uh, and dangerous politician. Okay. Uh, not just for the Palestinians, but for the Israelis themselves. Um, and and um, no, actually, the position today of most uh, Israeli citizens, Jewish Israeli citizens, uh, they are largely buying into the government propaganda, and I doubt uh, that they will uh, take another stand on UNRWA. For the moment, everybody is waiting for that. Before UNRWA, there will be all the story in Israel for the Jewish citizens of what happened on October the 7th and the 8th. And this uh, is, is, uh, is, is from there that we have to start. Second, if there should be, say, a ceasefire, a permanent ceasefire, uh, what about the ultra-Orthodox settlers in the West Bank? Those guys today are armed to the teeth. They are not ready to uh, put down their weapons. They are following their messianic view of reconquering uh, the Holy Land, building a Red Israel. And this will be probably opening up uh, a front inside Israeli society between the so-called uh, secular or rather liberal Jews and the ultra-Orthodox. So the UNRWA in all this uh, possible future is just one uh, part of the of the old stories but if you look at israeli society they will have rather uh, more important issues to deal with among themselves yeah absolutely, absolutely. thank you very much again ricardo and uh, in the name of the chs where we were really um, proud and delighted to have you again with us. And on this, I would like to thank very much Professor Ricardo Bocco and all the um, audience that was uh, here with us today. Um, there will be more um, uh, lectures on Gaza, especially in the weeks and months to come, of course. And again, thank you very much, Professor uh, Ricardo. And we hope to see you uh, soon in Doha. Inshallah. Everyone, have a very good day. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye. Bye.